So um, once again, thank you for our lunch lecture. We're very happy to be back um, in person today. And I would like to go ahead and introduce Betty Walkie, who's going to um, talk about Whips Garden Cemetery. Betty. Okay, thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Sean and Fred, and I think Mary, uh, and the Howard County um, Historical Society for this opportunity to give a little history and some of the story of the Whips Garden Cemetery. Um, my name is Betty Walkie. Um, I'm involved with the Whips family because I'm married to Dan Whips, who is sitting right here, who is a photographer. That's why he was very concerned about the uh, <laughs> up, up there. Um, uh, he is the great, great, great grandson of the founder of the Whips um, Garden Cemetery. There are many whips. Raise your hand if you are related to the whips. Any whips out here? We got this one right here. I'm kind of okay. Um, anybody related? Not related. Any volunteers or anybody? Oops, I'm done. Um, anyone? Any volunteers who've done work at Whips Cemetery or have been to Whips Cemetery? Yeah, I do. I do see some. I do see some volunteers. I think I saw Betty Rice before. Well, thank you. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your labors. Um, Okay, so my association with WIPS is fairly recent, and there might be people out there who were, who were involved in researching and um, helping kind of establish WIPS Cemetery and people who lived in the neighborhood. So I appreciate the, those people who, and um, if you have questions or comments, I'll ask you to share them at the end. You might know more secrets than I have any idea about. Um, so let's just we go to the next one. I think I will. Okay, so this is um, the front of Whips Garden Cemetery. It is on St. John's Lane. Uh, there's a sign out there, and I'll point out that this was spelled incorrectly. The name Whips is W H I P P S. This was this sign has since been um, corrected. Uh, this was as if it were Mr. Whip. <laughs> cemetery, so an apostrophe that has since been removed. So we are the Whipses, plural. Um, yeah, just, you know, it's good to know. Um, let's just go through, thank you. So we're going to go through kind of the mission, the history, the restoration of the cemetery, and some of the features and projects, ongoing projects for the cemetery. Okay, so in a nutshell, next one please, thank you. Um, the Whips Garden Cemetery educates and inspires visitors to preserve old cemeteries as a small community park, while as small community parks while showcasing local history, culture, um, in the style of 19th century garden cemeteries. So a lot of oh, and I should point out also that that little um, uh, angel, and it was interesting that Sean mentioned the sheriffs in the restored stained glass. Um, there are a lot of little angels, real little angels and statue little angels, and often Whip Cemetery is referred to as the Angel Garden. So, and that is something if you were to take kids or grandkids going around the cemetery and looking for the angels is a, is a sweet um, activity. Okay, next one please, thank you. Um, the mission is to preserve and maintain this one acre cemetery that was established in 1855. Um, the, as well as the physical grave monuments and the history of the old graveyard and both heritage and native plants. Next one, please. It is to encourage within the larger community a respect for Maryland's many old burial grounds dating to earlier centuries and thereby to build an appreciation of our rich cultural heritage. Um, number three, demonstrate through stewardship of the cemetery, uh, horticultural practices that are ecologically sound and protect the environment. And I'll talk about the Bay Wise in a little bit. Number four, adapt and ad uh, develop an adaptive use for the cemetery for community education of the history and culture of Ellicott City while demonstrating the use of, back to those plants, heritage and native plants in a contemporary landscape. And number five, next, thank you. 
um, protect a green space within an urban or suburban environment as a sanctuary for native plants, a haven for local wildlife, and a place of peace and tranquility to refresh the human soul. And if, if you have not been, I'm going to invite you so many times to come to Whips Garden Cemetery. If you've not been there, it is just a little oasis in the middle of um, a community. Okay, next, please. The location, Whips Garden Cemetery, is very close. Um, it is 0.5 miles from St. John's Cemetery on St. John's Lane. Um, and for those who like, it is 0.2 miles from the Rita's on Frederick Road. So uh, if you need to go through, we need a little, a little break. Um, next slide, please. So I found this drawing. Um, I do not, it is, was undated. I, I imagine that it was somebody's recollect, recollection at some point. But along the top is St. John's Lane, the cemetery is right up next to St. John's Lane. A couple barns, barns, and an old foundation. This is, in my mind, unless somebody here tells me otherwise, this is where I believe that the Whips family homestead originally was, this old foundation. Um, there still is a stream that runs to the side of it, and uh, Frederick Road, pardon me, is out on the other side. So, Whip Cemetery, how did this thing get started? Okay, um, in 1855, William Whips, of which there are so many William Whips in this story, but let's just start with number one, William Whips, um, was born 19, 1807, died 1861, bought one acre of land from Reuben Dorsey for the sum of $74.25, I've seen $74.20, you know, we're quibbling over <laughs> pennies, literally, um, to serve as the burial ground for his family. He owned property behind the cemetery, um, but wanted to have a space that was designated as a cemetery. In the late 1800s, um, plots were sold to other members of the community and it became known as the Whips Family and Public Cemetery. Okay. Next one, please. You are pretty young. Okay. Um, so, buried here are not the rich and famous people of Howard County. These were the simple people. Blacksmiths, farmers, merchants, mill and railroad workers, and of course their children. Um, and I, I'll get to it in a second, but um, it's interesting going through and you'll see the names of some of the people. There are names of children that don't correspond with the adults. So it seemed like maybe a lot of children were buried there and it wasn't in their family plots. Um, so there are 16 members of the Woods family buried here. 40 graves belong to members of the general public. And there are some stones that have no markings on them at all. Let me find my number here, okay. Um, Let's go to the next one, please. Some of the names on the gravestones, and maybe some people here, this might be um, a name within your family. Uh, I'll go to the, the Whips family, and I just want to read one of the epitaphs on one of these adult gravestones. Um, John A. Whips died at age 26 in 1873. And based on his epitaph, we can assume it was from disease or some kind of condition. And this is what his epitaph that's inscribed on his gravestone says. I get all. Anyway, um, this languishing head is at rest. It's aching and thinking are over. This quiet, immovable breast is heaved by affliction no more. So you can imagine he wasn't feeling well. <laughs> okay, now here's a sad one. Let's go to the next slide, please. So these are some of the um, children's last names that are on the tombstones or gravestones. Um, and I want to read another little sad one. Uh, this was for little William N. Phelps, who died August 1861. 
and apparently he was only so August, he died at eight months and eight days. Mm -hmm. And 1861, apparently there were a lot of deaths that year. And who can, perhaps someone knows whether there was a cholera outbreak or you know, some other situation. Um, but here's the, the epitaph on his gravestone. Weep not for little Willie, his gentle spirits quickly fled. He sweetly sleep, sleeps with Jesus, Jesus among the silent dead. Oh, I mean, <laughs> you guys. Okay. No. Um, the, okay, so let's go to the next one. Get back to our, our cemetery. Okay, the oldest grave is Mr. John White, who lived from 1780 to 1828. Now, this is an example of the cemetery wasn't established, property wasn't bought, the family wasn't even, well, might have been there. This is the father-in-law of the cemetery founder, William Whips. So he was married to uh, Sarah White, who was John's daughter. So it's thought that he was buried somewhere else when they got married, bought the, bought the, cemetery, or bought the land for the cemetery, that he was moved into the cemetery. Um, and that is the oldest um, gravestone there. Can we go to the next one, please? These were the first burials um, that, that actually predate that purchase. And again, it's thought that they were buried on the family homestead when the property was bought for a cemetery, they were moved into the cemetery. And these are two of um, William Whips's little children. Look, again, another William Francis, um, who died at only three weeks in 1833, and then Catherine Ann, who died in 1839 at only a year and a half. So let's go to our next one. So now, here is Samuel Whips. Let's, I'm, just, I'm going to call, call him the, the bearded one, okay, the bearded whips. And I'm sure every man in, you know, 1860 had a beard. Um, so Samuel Whips was a charter member of the Elephant City IIOF Lodge, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. He was a blacksmith, he was a farmer, he was a postmaster. He also became the cemetery director after his father, the original William Whips, passed away. Um, what else do I need to say about him? Okay, we'll move on. Here's some fun facts. Okay, about Mr. Samuel Whips, and you're going to have to use some math on some of these things. He was first married to Sarah Hooker. They had um, eight children, three boys, five girls. Sarah died in 1870. He married her younger sister. Um, and by younger, I mean really young. So if you do some math, if she was married in 1870, but she was born in 1857, she's pretty young. Anyway, they went on to have seven children, seven boys. So that's where we get a lot of whips names out. But there are even more whips names because the rumor is that he is, he is said to have had 26 children altogether. So if I do... 26 minus 15, there's some other unaccounted for whipses. So anyway, yeah. lots of cousins, right, Dan? Yeah, right. we're productive okay. people. Okay, so let's move on to this next slide. And I'm going to start getting into the years. So 1878, um, Samuel Whips with the, with the big beard um, kind of leaves the Whips Cemetery area and moves to purchases. Um, it was called Felicity in Oakland Mills. There was a blacksmith house and a shop, or a blacksmith shop and a house. Um, he operated the general store. He probably did some farming. He was a blacksmith, operated the blacksmith shop. Um, in 1893, not too long after that, he sold it to his son, William F. Whips. Apparently, again, a lot of Williams in his family. But this was his firstborn son. Um, Felicity... Uh, between 2011 and 2014 was on the National Register of Historic Places. And the blacksmith shop was the inspiration for Colonial Williamsburg consulted with this building when they were um, reconstructing their blacksmith shop. So um, we have a little connection to Williamsburg. Next one, please. Thank you. 
And this is a picture of the blacksmith shop. I do not know when this was taken. It is located in Oakland Mills um, and Route, Route 29. It operated as a blacksmith shop until 1950, which is crazy. Um, I'm not sure if it's torn down or not. You can't find I, it. You can't find it. I, it might be gone. Anyway, but this was this photograph is not that old, so it was up for a while. Has anybody seen? I've seen, seen it. it. I, I think I have. It's on the service room. Yeah. And it looks just like that. Oh, there you go. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe we should chip in. And, no, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> okay. We do the next one, please. Okay. Here's a little notoriety. Okay, so these are farm people, my friends. So there, here's some fun facts about William Whips, who was the son of Mr. Beard, who also worked as a blacksmith in that blacksmith shop. Um, William Whips, who, um, he died in 1930, who was the son of Mr. Mr. Beard, was known as one of the most successful professional cockfighters in the world. Who oh, knew? No. What a lovely thing. Um, apparently, he raised and conditioned fighting cocks in Maryland and Virginia. And I found that when that property um, in the documents from the National Register of Historic Places, um, it was a write up about the description of the building and a description of the people. So I just thought I would share. And this is a picture of my friend's chicken. So <laughs> why not? Okay, that same year, 1870. Thank you so much. You're doing a great job. <laughs> I'm just talking. Um, 1878 to 1899, 23 graves were moved from Whip Cemetery to the cemetery at St. John's. Um, not totally sure exactly why that happened. Um, perhaps it was that because the Whipses were no longer living in the area where the cemetery was it's probably started its decline at that point. And um, I'm gonna go to the next one, please. Thank you. Because by 1915, the last burial had happened. And the last burial actually was that um, young bride uh, that was married to the original Whips, um, Jane, Jane Hooker, the, the younger sister, and that was her grave. Um, so by 1915, it was because it was not affiliated with the church. There was no perpetual care. You know, people would take care probably of their own um, their own family's plots, um, but it did not have the care as most uh, cemeteries do today. And unfortunately, it became very overgrown, neglected, forgotten. Um, it was a playground for vandals, pranksters on Halloween. Speaking of Halloween. Um, and basically a community dumping ground, and it stopped being you know, recognized as, as a cemetery. Um, next one, please. Thank you. This is kind of out of, it's chronologically in order, but I'm just going to make the point. In 1953, members of the Colonel Thomas Dorsey chapter of the DAR were the first to actually go into the cemetery after it stopped being a cemetery to inventory the graves at, at, um, whip, at whips. Um, and their study was used in 1989 to kind of do an inventory of the graves at Whips. And it was determined that, you know, there were missing, there were head, headstones listed in this study that were no longer at the cemetery. So it could only be assumed that they were either stolen or completely, completely damaged. Um, next one, please. Thank you. Okay. So 1979 is a big year, 1975 is a big year. This is the discovery of Aunt, little Annie Renee's gravestone by a neighbor, a neighbor's son and his playmates. Um, and this little discovery would launch the drive to reclaim, to save the cemetery. And that person was um, uh, Mrs. Barbara C. Um, does anybody, did anybody know Barbara? Okay. Um, her family moved into the Dunlogan area in 1966. You know, just kind of a neighborhood, neighborhood lady. Um, and that's when she became, because her son, like, hey, we found this headstone. And she was like, eh, don't go over there. So that kind of put that to rest for a little bit. And I will say that this little headstone is closest to um, St. John's Lane. At, you know, as far as uh, positioning. Next one, please. Thank you. 
1984 happens, and all of a sudden, residential development um, begins along St. John's Lane. Uh, bulldozers begin clearing the land. Um, suddenly, questions are being asked about, is there a cemetery here? What are the boundaries? Um, you know, what are the boundaries of the Whip Cemetery? What about that uh, cemetery that was dating to the revolutionary times? Like, what's going on? And um, I'm not going to get into all of that, but there are a lot of kind of land disputes, neighbors buying houses, and there are graves in their backyard. So there was a lot of um, uh, challenging things going on in there. Um, and as a result, the Whips family and the developer were contacted to kind of stop the, you know, this process um, and to determine what the boundaries were. And we'll go to the next one, please. And this is um, Barbara Seek, who unfortunately passed away a couple years ago. Um, some of her uh, uh, accolades, uh, she was uh, the St. John's Community Association president. In her own words, she was an activist that was not born, but was made. Um, she's been referred to as the mother of cemetery protection in Maryland. She was the 25-year Whip Cemetery director and our visionary, and she became a Howard County Master Gardener to further her knowledge of um, plants and, and native plants. Next one, please. Thank you. 1985, Barbara wrote to the Whips family, and this is the letter, and I think this is another William F. Whips. How many were there? Um, who I think, Dan, is like a cousin of yours. I don't know if you even knew. That's Bunny? I think it might be Bunny Whips. I don't know. That's an unusual name. You would know it or, or don't yeah, know it. I do know. She reached out to the family, and he um, gave her permission to try to restore, try to recover the cemetery. And I'm just going to read this one part. I know this has been an eyesore for many years, both to me and to the community. When the project is complete, maybe people will also stop using it as a dumping ground and try to keep it as a beautiful spot you plan to make it. Um, and I will have some of my family to help clear some of the Whips area of the plot and also reset some of the stones. So the Whips family was involved at the very beginning, not only, and we'll go to the next slide, please, not only you know, digging and weeding and standing here, but um, a new deed of ownership um, created a nonprofit where it was deeded to this nonprofit. And that's where the Friends of Whips Cemetery and Memorial Gardens, Inc. came, came along. And this is the, today, this is the nonprofit that maintains the, um, to, well, preserves, restores, and maintains the property. Next one, please, thank you. Okay, so before it started being, and I'm using this, this word rest, restoration, it may, may not, I'm not a history person, so I might be using the word wrong, but I'm sorry. Um, so before, it was a mess. I mean, just vines everywhere, briars, um, just impossible. You could only go a few steps without having to, to um, prune, prune your way. Next one, please. Here's another shot of that. You can see one of the, um, the gravestones is actually standing up, but there was poison ivy, there were grapevines, very few evergreens, some kind of, um, you know, some of the trees just were not in good condition. And all that stuff had to be removed. And that is, that is a lot of work. And I will say I was not there, and thank you to all those people who were. Um, next slide, please. So again, before the uh, restoration, you know, there were there were gravestones found, but some were broken, some were buried. Um, a lot of the work involved was, um, you know, having to dig this up. Next slide, please. And there's an example of a, a broken um, tombstone. Okay. Okay. So as the as Barbara got into this, as the neighborhood got into it. Um, there was, you know, a lot of neighborhood support. I think there was some not positive neighborhood support. You know, maybe some, some of you lived there and were aware of that. Um, but there was kind of this rallying call that you know, Barbara led with her other neighbors to save a cemetery, create a park. And um, you know, young and old volunteered 
doing physical labor as well as fundraising. And as I look back through some of the notes, I mean, you know, bake sales were held and wreaths were made, made like anything to help um, um, with fundraising. Next slide, please. Okay, here's a good example. This is, again, uh, the restoration took place mostly through the 80s through 90s. I mean, this, this is like a sweet little shot. It just shows like a bunch of bottles and stuff. But imagine literally tons of stuff had to be dug up, cut down, taken out, moved out. So um, that was one of the major tasks was just to remove all the debris, all the debris. And, you know, again, literally tons of trash and plant matter were removed. Next one, please. Okay, 1987. Um, as the clearing continued, a sign was erected that identified the cemetery and gave credit to the volunteers who were involved. Um, there was a ceremony at the time, um, Howard County City Executive Elizabeth Bobo uh, praised the pro project as a model in the, country, in the county. And it was noted that the project was important because desecrating graves and vandali vandalizing cemeteries is against the law in Maryland. Um, so, you know, it wasn't just to make it look nice. It was, there were some legal um, uh, issues with it. Next one, please. Okay. This is Barbara. I mean, I, I was, I actually have this dress in my possession and I have worn it at different, um, different events, but what a woman she was. I mean, just, she was in it. But I just wanted to just go through some of the um, some of the people. Besides of pulling weeds, she talked to people. She did research. Um, some of the things she was told: don't do anything. This is a historical place. Don't do anything that is irreversible. Um, she talked to a naturalist to make sure that you make this um, area environmentally um, fauna and flora friendly. Um, she talked to gravestone uh, preservationists. Um, and I saw, there's some more, but I saw also um, this newsletter. I picked it up just out, outside, remembering Anna Lee Bounds. And maybe a lot of you know her. Barbara, like, cited Anna Lee was instrumental in teaching her about Howard County, about the area. So it is, um, I, and, you know, just what a nice coincidence that Anna Lee, you know, is here today. Okay. Um, next, oh, there we go. Okay. Another resource um, on geneal genealogy. And this was a book, um, Genealogy is Morgan Sharks. Lady Miller, who I think I heard as a master gardener, uh, she talked about um, parks, plants, and people beautifying the, land, the urban landscape. And then Howard County Gardeners, George Ecker. And I want to um, reference the person who took over Barbara's directorship of the cemetery was, is, was Alita Gravel, who just um, uh, retired this year. But you know, just the Howard County Master Gardeners, just a tremendous force in maintaining um, and having a vision, not just like, you know, but thinking about like, gosh, you know, maybe we need to put a whole barrier of trees over there. So it's not just maintaining, it's designing also. Next one, please. Thank you. Okay, 1989, here's where some blood, sweat, and tears come in. They decided um, to actually create a cemetery entrance. And it was all built with de donations of time, of money, of materials. Next one, please. Um, now, I don't know if this is Mr. Piccarelli himself, but um, uh, let, me, let me see what the amount was. It was like six and a half tons of granite and flagstones. Mr. Piccarelli, anyone here from the quarry? Um, donated and delivered stone for this entranceway. And that could be, he's a great guy, he was a great guy. I think Barbara had a way of, <laughs> well, anyway. Okay, next one, please. Um, here's a cemetery entrance. I believe this is Mr. Frank Dinman, who, uh, uh, donated 
his stonework labor. Apparently he had never really done stonework. He was not a professional, but that was, you know, apparently he had a passion and, and the opportunity to do that. He was a, a self-taught stonemason. Next one, please. And here is the cemetery entrance as it looks today. Um, an iron worker, again, volunteering, set the, uh, that iron gate was rescued, not from the cemetery, but from somewhere else, set that in. That's actually a little sign that, desi that designates the, uh, the cemetery. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, 1990, here's another letter. Barbara tried to get the, and succeeded in getting the uh, Witch Cemetery on the Maryland Historical Trust. Um, let's see. Yep. So that was in 1990. So it is, just in case you need to know, it's number 579, just for future reference. Okay, number next one. So Barbara's passion for whips only grew. Um, so not only was she, she wanting to fix up the cemetery herself, she was very concerned about just the future of cemeteries and preserving cemeteries. Um, and because existing laws governing barrier, barrier grounds did not cover willful neglect, nor the rights of descendants and lot owners. So she enlisted others from across the state in it, her mission to protect our Maryland burial sites. Next one, please. So by 1991, the Coalition to Protect Maryland Burial Sites was created, and she was a founder of this. And um, its mission a, was dedicated to raising public awareness of threats to our historic uh, graveyards and to strengthen Maryland and local laws protecting ce ce cemeteries. Okay, next one, please. And by 1993, now she has um, that's for our, our uh, late uh, Governor Schaefer um, signed into law the Family Remembrance Week Proclamation. Could you go to the next one, please? And basically what that did was celebrate the importance of family ties and family heritages, heritages as keeping the spirit of the past alive will surely benefit our families in the future. So, and of course that kind of correspond, corresponded with um, Memorial Day, which all, you know, cemeteries are, are always, that's traditionally when um, you would go to memorialize your family. Okay, back to the cemetery. Here is what the front view looked like, all dug up. Next one, please. And now, look how beautiful. So in the summer, we have lilies. Lilies just happen, happen to be symbols of reservation, resurrection. They're, they're shown on many um, grave markers. Next one, please. And in the spring, daffodils. Who doesn't love a daffodil? Um, and daffodils are interesting in that um, well, back to Barbara, she saved like hundreds, probably thousands of daffodil bulbs um, in the early, early times of restoring the cemetery. They were, um, the rectory at St. John's Episcopal Church was being redeveloped and there were all these daffodils. So she enlisted her neighbor to go dig them up, to transport them and plant them again. And maybe, maybe someone's here who, who was involved in that, I don't know. Um, but daffodils are pretty cool because you know, they're historically are cemetery flowers because they're often planted by family members. They're easy care, they're resilient, and they're planted as a living tribute to um, loved ones. Um, and, they're, and actually at the cemetery, there is a wonderful, in the spring, a daffodil demonstration garden that has, you know, and I'm not a daffodil girl, but like, I don't know, 45 different varieties. And, you know, it's very, very scientific how it's done, but it's, it's fascinating. Um, and yeah, okay. Okay, so grave restoration. Um, archaeologist Dean Corpin was uh, consulted and I guess hired or, and were donated um, trying to find, find the graves, Dig them out. Next one, please. I mean, literally grave digging is happening right here. Next one, please. Um, William Whips, who was that first, very first Whips, um, his was one of the first ones to be restored correctly. 
And I will mention that, let's see, right now with Cemetery, we're trying to, it's been a challenging year. The fact that you guys are just back here for the first time in, in a long time. Um, you know, we're going through the same challenges that we haven't been able to do things, but we are working on doing a grave um, preservation workshop with um, Robert, Robert Moscow, who is owner of Moscow Cemetery and Monument Services, which specializes in preserving, conserving, restoring, and re rehabilitating historical cemeteries. So there is an art to this, and maybe some of you, there was something that came out recently. Some volunteer tried, not locally, but tried to scrawl the gravestone and did a bad thing. So anyway, there's, there's a, a method. Um, today, maintenance of, of graves, of graves, Barbara's there, actually, Dan, Dan is there, JP. So there's constantly, you know, the ground moves, and there's constantly the need to, you know, kind of put, um, keep the graves upright. Um, next one, please. Here's an example of, actually, there's um, granite siding along the graves that had to be, had to be realigned. Okay, and this happens to be in, um, next one, please. The Gall family, G-A-W family. Um, this one, this plot, family section is uh, kind of poignant, and I'm gonna push it. Next one, please. Um, in this grave, there are, it includes, besides some parents, um, six Gall family children who died within a decade of each other, mm -hmm. from 1846 to 1857. And you can see here, it's one single triple grace Great headstone, but down here at the bottom, the little footsto footstones have each child's um, initials on it. And it's just, you know, it's, it's real. Um, here is how it looks today. And um, it has the, the iron post around it. Although I have to say, that looks like it needs a little weeding right there. So <laughs> this might not be like today. This might be present today. Okay. Next one, please. Iron work. Restoration of the ironwork. Anybody's an iron worker, you, you might appreciate this. Um, so some of the plots were were encompassed with this ironwork. This particular one, there were no graves in it. So it's thought that maybe this whole family or group of people might have been some that were moved to um, to the uh, Saint jo John's Cemetery. I'm gonna just jump up here to the next one. Okay, um, is that, has anyone heard of um, Dysart McMullen? So apparently he was a very prolific writer uh, and poet um, from this area. He grew up on um, St. John's Lane in, a, um, I think the family home was called Woodley. And in, I don't know, he reflected back, he wrote about this, he reflected back in the 1900s when he was a child um, about going to Whip Cemetery with his maid, his nurse maid. And in his words, the cemetery already was virtually abandoned from its functional character, but there were early headstones going back to revolutionary times, some of the lots enclosed by cast iron ropes, fashioned with hollow tassels in which wasps found their nests. Now, exactly what he's describing was found. It was dug up, it had been buried, and was found. Next one, please. And it was restored. And a lot of effort went into and, and research was done to figure out how it should be restored. Um, and I will say that if anybody knows the iron sculptor Bill Knapp, who's right on, um, he assisted in that, which was very nice. And here's one of the details, is this insignia, which is, it represents the all-seeing eye symbol, which is <laughs> one of the symbols for the independent order of odd fellows. Anyone, any odd fellows here? Okay. Um, so odd fellows, the odd fat fellow lodge, I think we can, I'm gonna talk about it in a second. Um, so next one. So Independent Order of Odd Fellows is also known as the Triple Link Fraternity, and there are many tombstones within the cemetery that have this triple link, and they're not just all whipses. And typically, um, a lot of blacksmiths belong to this, I'm going to call it fraternity. But the symbol and motto, friendship, love, and truth. And it was referred to as kind of the poor man's Freemasonry. Um, 
And we can go to the next one. And lo and behold, right down the street is the, the Center Lodge. And it's one of the uh, few completely detached buildings in Elephant City is their lodge. And from the research I did, I mean, I just you know, went on Facebook. I mean, they're an active, active group. So, um, and they're, they were called Odd Fellows because when they were first established, um, they did altruistic work, which people thought was odd at the time. So, okay, next one, please. Okay, and speaking of symbols, these are some of the typical 19th century graveyard symbols, a weeping willow, a rose. Next one, please. And on children's, um, a wilted tulip, an angel, and a dead lamb. There's a lot of um, lamb um, imagery in the cemetery. Okay, and speaking of children, if you were to go, all the graves of children are marked or designated with the Maryland flag, the Maryland state flag, so that's how you can tell their birth. Okay, next one. Okay, the Whips family. This is an old shot. Um, there are 16 members of the Whips family buried there. As per re restoration reclamation started, a whole line of Whips graves were discovered kind of on another property and were relocated and placed at the rear of the cemetery. Okay, the next one please. And this is how it looks today. This is at the rear. There is a, um, a wooden fence that runs along the back and all the whipses are in that back area. And I will say, let's see. Is that right? Okay. Okay, features. 2007, the cemetery received, based on their thoughtful um, plant choices and uh, locations, was given the AY certification, which is all about um, educating residents and being eco um, ecologically friendly. Uh, native trees and plants um, were planted to kind of avoid runoff, and that's on 74. So this was the stream that runs along the side. As you're looking at the cemetery, there is a stream and there, a grant was given to um, kind of control that runoff. Next one, we promote native plants. There's a combination of plants, but um, a lot of information about native plants. Um, we have a Y oak. Now it wasn't the original Y oak. It is a sibling of the Y oak that um, a University of Maryland horticulturist, um, you know, took a grafting from an acorn, from a seedling, and boom. Um, so here's our our Y oak sibling, which is the state tree. Which the Y oak was the oldest tree, the oldest oak, I think, in the United States. Okay, next one, please. Uh, 2011, we have a beautiful, very formally designed um, uh, garden. This is our herb garden that was dedicated to Barbara Seed and to um, uh, you know, all the work and vision that she had done. And it, it's quite lovely. Rose Garden. We have a poly it was butterfly, now it's pollinator garden. Um, and just, I have an affinity for butterflies, a butterfly garden. Did you know the butterfly is a symbol of eternity? Kind of makes sense that. That would be in the cemetery there. We have a lot of information. Every tree, every plant section, um, there is a sign that tells you what it is. Lots of brochures. Next one. And we have a lot of memorial signage. Um, we, as um, as a garden group, as a family, as an organization, we may adopt a section at the Whips Garden Cemetery. Um, adopters are required to follow certain guidelines for the care of the gravestones and plant recommendations. Um, when my father-in-law, Dan's dad, died in 2012, we, we donated a bench and a sourwood tree to, you know, as a symbol of that. Um, community projects. Oops. Oh, okay. you're good. Sorry. Oh. You're good. Next one. Okay. So many Eagle Scouts, so many Boy Scouts have helped throughout the years to you know, create, in this case, um, you know, where do the, the, the paths go? Uh, basically, the gravestones uh, dictated where the paths should be. And this was all done using, you know, environmental uh, uh, things like um, logs and wood chips. So very natural. Next one, please. 
here's some Girl Scouts. I mean, they're, you know, they're not just cutting flowers and plant it, planting and watering. I mean, they are doing work. So throughout the years, Girl Scouts. Next one, here's our Boy Scouts. They made this great retaining wall. They did the compost bin. Next one. Another Eagle Scout, 1997, created, there's a little presentation area. Here's an example of a, I think it's a Master Garden group um, uh, doing a presentation about uh, plants or ecological practices. Next one. Okay, I love this. I found, because I inherited a lot of materials. Um, in 2000, there was a re-inventory of grave markers. And Elizabeth Allen, who went to Centennial High School, this was her, like, I'm not even sure she's a senior. It was a, a mentor project. She worked with a, a, a master, I think she had her master's in archaeologist, archaeology, another woman, um, a young woman, and they set about to re-measure, re-note, like what condition are all the graves in? Um, and she had a little note, and I had this whole, like, humongous document that this, you know, high school student put together, you know, under the, under the mentorship of, of an archaeologist. Um, but she had a little note in the beginning, and she wrote, you know, history has now become more alive. I mean, isn't that what we all want, right? Okay, next one, please. Okay, and, they're in, and they actually, um, and that's one of their photographs, which actually ha happens to be a, um, another whips, of course, another little whips. Um, and, but it's all like really documented, like the conditions. Um, here's the beginning of his little epitaph. I take this little lamb, said he. You know, how sweet. So they, they documented all their information. Next one. And I want to go back. It originally had been done in 1992 by another cataloger, and I don't know who this person was, um, David Onquist. Um, so they worked from his materials. Okay, Master Gardeners. Cannot say enough about Master Gardeners. Howard County, Master Gardeners, and community volunteers, and gardeners, and people who are just interested, and people who have a passion for being in that space, maintain. Um, the, the cemetery now, and it's it's stunning. Um, and literally, I mean, people are getting their hands dirty. It's not just it's not it's not just planting flowers. It's digging and moving and cleaning. So thank thank them very much. Next one, please. Some of the events. This was actually a um, part of the next event, which is the Daffodil Day. Thus, the daffodils. We have lots of daffodils. This is our we have two fundraisers, Daffodil Day, and the next one is our annual plant sale. Unfortunately, for the past two years, neither one of those have happened, so we are sad about that and desperately trying to, um, you know, re, re uh, fund our our community um, at Whips Garden Cemetery. But miracles happen. Okay, so let's get to the okay, this one. Will, one will make me cry. Um, little Annie Verne, we started this whole presentation about her little, little grave. And Dysart McMullen, who wrote about the Whips graveyard as a child, he recalled seeing a child's grave surrounded by a picket fence less than a foot high. So, and again, this little grave is really close to um, St. John's Lane. And I do want to read, um, the, the epitaph on this grave, and it's only one line is visible from, from now. The rest of it is under the ground. Um, and here's how it goes. We love this tender little one and would have wished her stay, but let our father's will be done. She shines in endless day. How beautiful is that? Okay. So on behalf of Whips, of the Friends of Whips Garden Cemetery, the Whips family, all the volunteers who help, um, our hope is that this little sanctuary will shine in endless day and be enjoyed by the Howard County community and appreciated for its beauty and its history. And I invite you to stop by and visit. It's, you gotta find a parking space, that's our challenge, but it's open all the time. People have lunches there, people get proposed to there. It is, 
it's just lovely. And it's just a respite. It's beautiful. Um, and again, it's for gardeners. It has everything marked. And it's just an interesting thing to take for grown-ups, for kids. So I invite you. So I think that's it. You know, that is a really, that's a really good question. Um, I know Dan could say his father was aware of it, but I think the family had moved out to Oakland Mills. And I think it really kind of was just abandoned. Um, there was something, I, I might not get this right, I did see something about, a question about the Whips family, like what did, what did they have to do? Like, why didn't they pay taxes? And apparently, I don't know what law this is, but if you, if it's on a cemetery that's no longer accepting um, burials, there is no tax to be paid. However, I will say we pay taxes as, as this, um, as a foundation. I, I don't have that answer. I, and I know the people involved before us were another side of the family that Dan didn't even know. Like all those 26 Samuel Beard Whipses. Yeah, that's, that is a good question. Why didn't they go back? Mm-hmm. Kind of, kind of, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you know if they started using ground penetrating radar on the Oh gosh, that, I personally don't know that. It probably, I don't know. I don't know. But I know there have been, and I'm not even going to get into it, there have been, um, you know, with dumping, with other, I think there were some situations with other people being buried there, like after that 1915, that. On top of. On top of, yeah. So I, I think, but this, but that was like the turn of the, last century that there's issues. Yes, sir. Is there any uh, reference material that you can search for your time here or your death record of things that have been written to use as a guide? Okay. That is an awesome question because this presentation has been made many times. And one, um, I mean, I, I did not even bring everything I have, but Barbara C., before she passed away, did, um, It's called the Angel Garden, One of God's Acres, the Plight of Historic Cemeteries in Maryland, in which she documented everything that happened. There are so many deeds and land plats and appendices to this that I don't really understand, Um, but I know that all that stuff happened, and I I know that there were issues with um, the developer clearing the land. Do you live... In Dunlop County? Uh, no. Okay. Five, but okay. Sure. I know that there were issues with the developer and, and people who bought homes, and I think graves were moved and then moved back sure. and then hidden. Yeah, hidden. So I think there were a lot, and, and it's weird because at that time the movie Poltergeist, I don't know. If you I mean, it's a real, right? It's a real thing about. What time frame was that? Well, when the alarms went off at 84 was when it first started. And I know there were legal things going on. I think there were legal things with um, um, the WIPS member who gave permission to use it. I think there was a jet, and I just didn't understand it enough to synthesize it for this, but like a gentleman's agreement to maybe move, not the, not necessarily the grades, although I think that happened, but to move the boundaries or to allow certain things. So. Um, yeah, I think there. Are, I believe me. I, I thought about like taking a shot of like some of these plats just to show that all that stuff was done. There was a lot of archaeology stuff happening. There was a lot of land, and, and in fact, I mean, it went back to you know it was called Rebecca's Lot in you know 1755. I mean, there was a lot of research done on trying to figure out what the boundaries were. 
Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I do have another question, actually, but um, I want to thank you for the magnificent program. My name is Cynthia. I knew it was you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That makes me cry because well, I get so much. It's she, this woman, was incredible. She was incredible. Yes, sir. So, what's the only words that would move to into the cemetery? Would they previously on some of the fire? Um. So there was the little the little babies were on the Whips homestead that was part of that property, but those other ones. I think they were, well, I think because the land got developed or was being developed, and that's where the boundaries weren't defined. So I think that's when they got like, okay, well, you can have this part and this part, but there's some graves over there. So shh, that's, so I think there was a lot of, because they did find pieces that were like wired together. Like, like people had been shifting things around. Yes. You had mentioned about the, babies that you know didn't belong sort of to the family that was a very common practice um i know in, in cases my own family cemeteries where they would let you borrow a spot and then frequently you could come back and, and move them but in some cases they never did move them and that's probably right. what those right. were that was yeah that, that's what i assumed that the names didn't match up and there were so many little babies yeah. like that and it, and it, and I think that there are more because there are little stones that I think in different like Quakers don't really have mm -hmm. grave gravestones that are marked. So there probably are more people in there. Yes, yeah, stones going back to your question. Yeah. But do you have one of those that we can no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry, any other questions? I thought I was talking. Yes, ma'am. I just I just wanted to say I worked on the history. Uh, a Boston County history in Woodlawn, and there was an instance where there was a graveyard, and the developer just came in and picked them bull, bulldozed, literally picked it all mm. over the graves and bulldozed yeah. dumped them over the fence. Mm. And apparently, yeah. that was not unusual. They dropped it at night and they all disappeared. Yep. Right. right. You know, Oops. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something Barb was outraged, and you know, since Boba, you could like comment on that I and mean, she was outraged that you know that this was a cemetery this was a sacred place it's not just um you know more thought needs to be given and that's why she became more involved in the legal aspect of it and the awareness of and i know there are a lot of cases with cemeteries she talked about the saint mary's cemetery and you know there's you know just the care and you know discare of of cemeteries as an issue Thank you. Thank you. That was marvelous. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Follow us on Facebook if you want to. If anybody wants to be the director of Rips Garden Cemetery, I invite There's you to button. contact me to work with me. Um, um, it is a again. It's